I almost wasn't paying attention there. Good evening and apologies. For what? Yes, I almost didn't. Hello and welcome to Live Irish Mits. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is episode number 243. Tonight we are returning to P.W. Joyce's uh, Social History of Ancient Ireland, which so far, I'm not sure if you agree, I hope you do, has been a fabulous read. Just realized something. That's why I was distracted. I shared an image, a couple of images today on the Mythical Ireland community. I've been very lucky since the pandemic calmed down uh, to meet, you know, uh, a lot of the Tua face to face in, in real life. And in the past week, I had met Monica Regley and um, Helen Hirsch Chader. And I had forgotten how dare I that uh, I had also met um, Alana Hudis. So I need to rectify that, uh, which I'm going to do right now while I'm live streaming, because I just feel that if Alana was looking at that, she's like, OK, he's sharing the pictures of those two. Why isn't he sharing a picture of me? And she'd be absolutely right, because being the idiot that I am, I forgot. So let me just quickly rectify that. Mm -hmm. Three. Three of the mythical Monica Regley, Helen Hirsch, Shader. And Alana Hudis from Washington State. How could I have done that? Anyway, it's rectified now. But what a moment to realize I made a boo-boo a boo just as I literally seconds before we went live. Uh, apparently, Anne Scott Doherty has her dram ready. Oh, nice. Quaffing the old dram. I like that. That's a picture. Uh, anyway, let me scroll back because I may have missed. Um, let me, well, we start the evening, of course, with Elaine Dent Lingenfelter, as always, or nearly always, the first commenter. And it's 33 Celsius in... Texas, stop boasting. It's 13 Celsius here today in rain. <sighs> Feels like winter here already. After all the good weather we had recently. Anyway, Lane, hope you're in good form. Good of you to join us. Brendan Byrne says, good evening, Anthony and the two. I was thinking that Fulcher Ireland should sponsor Mythical Ireland as it connects so many people from around the world and invites them to come to our magical island. If you can have a word with the appropriate people, Brendan, you know, I am completely open to all that. Yes. But thank you for your kind comment. Glad that you enjoy the whole mythical Ireland experience. Heather Marie Leaning is in the house saying hello to everybody and Anthony and Tom King. Hello, Heather, and welcome. Good afternoon, good evening, good night. Mark Gordon, who is, I think, in Iowa. Uh, good afternoon to you, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Adrian O'Beglin is in the house. Good evening to you. Trinonawat Machara. And... Uh, Good evening, good evening. Archaeolinguistics. Archaeo Archaeolinguistic adventures. Woo. And I can't see the rest. Apologies. One moment. You might hear another me here in a second. I'm going to shut him up. Um, can I see that comment on the live stream? Uh, Archaeolinguistics. Archaeolinguistic adventures with Nolan. Lawa from Pennsylvania. Well, a good afternoon to all our Pennsylvanian friends, our Philadelphian uh, and others and Pittsburgh and all of that. Uh, good afternoon to you. Hope you're in good form. Thanks for joining us. Uh, J.M.C.H. Smith, who is Jan, says hello. Hello, Jan. Thanks for joining us again. Um, and... Uh, and Scott's already says, not really. I have a modest glass of wine. Greetings, everyone. That's okay. Modest. Yeah, everything in moderation. Even moderation itself. Lily Shambles, good evening to you. Toronto, Lily, welcome to the, I was going to say the shack. That's what we say in ham radio terminology. Welcome to the library and the studio. Anne McCallum says, hello, Anton and the mighty Tua. 
Hope everyone's having a lovely day. Cloudy, 13 Celsius this morning. Yeah, I know all about that. But now a beautiful sunny day, 22. I don't know anything about that. Enjoyed your post and photos at Tom's, etc. As always, looking forward to story time. Brilliant stuff and good afternoon to you. Thanks for joining us. Peter Stewart is in the house. Good evening to you, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Anna L is also in the house. Good evening, Anna L. Thank you for... And Anna L is just down the road. Um, or Burgess 22 says, Hello all from the Catskills in New York. Good afternoon to all our New Yorkian and indeed East Coast friends. Uh, Tuesday Thompson says, Hello. So happy to have you back on my favourite day of the week. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, uh, by... Um, virtue of the fact that I was giving a talk in Drogheda here last night uh, on the first day of the Boyne Valley Trails September Walking Festival. And uh, just to mention, there are still tickets available for lots of the events. But I know that you being su uh, such wonderful Mythical Ireland followers, you're probably more interested in the two that I'm giving at the weekend. Maybe not. And that's being very presumptuous, I know. Uh, the Myths and Legends of the Hill of Tara on Saturday next, the 23rd of September at 2 p.m. Uh, and I will share the link to that where you can, if you're in Ireland or you're going to be around and you want to come along, this is where you get your tickets. And then on Sunday, what I would call the big one uh, in terms of distance, uh, the Myths and Legends of Brunabonia. We're going to walk from the Brunabonia Visitor Centre over to Douth, talk about Douth. Then we're going to walk to Nouth and do a little tour of Nouth. And then we're going to walk to Newgrange and talk about Newgrange from the public road there. And um, it's an eight kilometer or five mile walk. So uh, there are still tickets available for that right now, but they are selling fast. And I'm not lying, they are. So if you're coming, get your tickets now. Um, who else have we got? Paul Goran was, uh, uh, he's out dog walking from Rath Shannon Oath. Wow. Interesting place name. Paul, such a joy to see you. And thanks for joining us. Gosh, I forgot, says Elaine. I didn't know it last week when you were live, but our Cheyenne left hospital and is in therapy center now. Brilliant stuff. And the best wishes to her, Elaine, from all of us. Uh, and hopefully uh, she will continue to make a great recovery. Caitlin Moon is in the house. Uh, from a blustery Dublin and Caitlin is absolutely relaxing after a very stressful um, uh, preparation of a big document and all of that. Hope you're in good form, uh, Caitlin. Adina Sparks is here. Hope everyone's doing well. Looking forward to today's reading. Yes, oh my. Uh, we're even going to talk about how the Irish conquered Britain. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, Miss Tom King, uh, he's there, I know. And I missed his comment. There we go. Hello there, Anthony and the mighty to a, a wintry feel to this evening in the Boyne Valley and rapidly fading light. A good fire going and it's story time. Enjoy. Well, Tom and I had the wonderful pleasure of the company of the prehistory guys uh, on Sunday. I had the pleasure of them for two days. But we visited Tom's Forge on Sunday, having been at the Hill of Tara and in Fornox. Uh, we went to Tom's Forge, where we were given a stout and warm welcome. And everybody loved the uh, time at the Forge. Really fun time was had by all. And uh, I spent a, an excess of time. Uh, not that you could spend an, an excess of time with Michael Bott and Rupert Soskin and their lovely uh, entourage of uh, uh, participants in their uh, Ireland tour, which was going on until today. I think it was eight or uh, nine or ten days, and uh, uh, they were all flying home today. Um, so, um, thank you for the memories and the wonderful time. It was just uh, so enjoyable uh, and good fun, as you would expect. So, I would hope uh, we were talking last night here. They were staying here in Drogheda in the D Hotel, and I was chatting with Michael and Rupert. And one way or another, either they are going to have me on their show, or I'm going to have them on my show. And we'll do a follow up and we'll talk about all the things that we learned. They learned that they learned in Ireland and all of the things that I learned from them. What a wonderful time, uh, really. What a privilege, uh, not just to be uh, guiding uh, visitors around the Boyne Valley, but to be guiding uh, the, the likes of the prehistory guys. Good friends, 
and long may that last. Uh, Susan Scott says it's cold and breezy in northwestern Connecticut, feeling like autumn. Do you know what? Copy and paste. Copy what you said and paste it, because that's exactly how it's feeling here. No idea why I'm brandishing a uh, smartphone uh, little tripod. But anyway, I am. I'm brandishing it uh, in a very non-threatening manner. <laughs> it, it's going to be my pointer. Yes, I'm going to, I'm going to point at you, <laughs> all three of you. Irish Technical Thinker says, greetings to a more. Good evening to you, uh, Marcus. And a, sorry, the camera's in the way as always. Smallish gathering this evening. But that's because I upset things by giving a talk last night in Drogheda, which was called, What Can Mythology Tell Us About the Boyne Monuments? And uh, a lovely little gathering in the Punt Pub here in Drogheda. And very uh, gracious thanks to uh, 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 Boyne Valley Trails and to Love Drogheda and to Sarah Taff, the proprietor of the Punt. And Coda says hello, by the way. And uh, yeah. I enjoyed it, and there were lots of questions and feedback afterwards, which is always great. So, um, at some point, I'm planning to give a Zoom version of that talk, uh, and I will announce tickets. Uh, there'll probably be just a, something like a fiver ahead or something, but I'll do that one on Zoom uh, shortly so that you can all enjoy it. And I'll show the slides and I'll give you the same talk, basically. John Main is in the house from Crete. Looking forward to another enlightening evening as ever. The only reason the evenings the live Irish Mitz evenings are enlightening is because we are so regularly enlightened by the good Tua who watch and contribute and add their uh, voices and expertise. So it's great. Caitlin says, it worked out for me. I was so busy getting my final PhD chapter done that I forgot it was Monday and missed my paleography class. And I thought this too. Uh, not this, thankfully. Yeah, because we postponed. Same as last week. We did it on Tuesday last week as well. So uh, we are going to, have I anything else to announce other than the Boyne Valley Trails? Myths and Legends of Tara on Saturday and Myths and Legends of Bruno Bonia on Sunday. Sunday is meeting at 1 p.m. at the Bruno Bonia Visitor Centre. And uh, Tara is 2 p.m. at Tara on Saturday. That's next Saturday, the 23rd. So busy, busy, busy time, uh, which is good. Yes, indeed. Okay. Let's get on with it, shall we? So I'm just going to be finishing a chapter here, or a section of a chapter. Um, so I've, I've five or six pages to read, and then we're beginning the chapter on warfare. <laughs> yeah. Game of Thrones, eat your heart out. That the above details of the king's household are not fictitious is shown by several statements in Irish authorities setting forth the households of Irish kings and chiefs in comparatively late times, from the 11th to the 13th or 14th century, written by persons who describe things as they actually saw them, and whose descriptions are still extant. These set forth the various hereditary offices, similar to those stated above for the older kings, though with differences in detail, as might be expected. For example, the following were the chief officers, officers of the household of O'Kelly, King of Hymani, in the 13th and 14th century. Marshal of the Forces, O'Connell, Master of the Horse, Hifiachrach Finn, Doorkeeper, Hifiachrach Finn, Butler, o -O -Or Oroin, Superintendent of Banquets, i.e. Rechtere, O'Lovon, King's Immediate Guard, Clan Inderachti, Sorry, indirectly, not indirect, indirectly, uh, the indirect clan. <laughs> Sorry, mm. straight face, Anthony. Uh, keeper of cattle, treasures and chessboard, O'Flaheli. Keeper of arms and dresses, clan Bressel. Answer of challenges to single combat from outside territories, clan Bressel. Avenger of insults. Clan Egan, I think that's very funny. The Avenger of Insults in the King's uh, Company. Imagine that. That's interesting. That's, that's so funny. I'm putting a little laughing face beside that. Um, yeah, Clan Egan. Steward, Ace Abranger, Keeper of Hounds, the Cruffons, 
Inaugurators and deposers, Clan Jirmada, Hikormak, and Omihan, or High Cormac, if you like. Rearers of horses, Kinnail Eda. Rearers of hounds, the people of Shlivati. Carriers of wine from the harbours to the king's residence. A very important task. They are the Dal Thrithne. Builders or, or erectors of edifices, the high doc, Docomlan. D O C O M L A N N. Is that Docovlan? Docovlan. It's a very strange one. Anyway, Teresa Collins is in the house. Hello, Teresa. Good evening to you. As is Sotonar. How late am I? Yeah, you're only, you've only missed a paragraph. So uh, not very late is the answer. Uh, but welcome. Uh, Stewards of rents and tributes, the chiefs of the cantred of Kala. Wow. Each chief of whatever grade kept a household after the manner of a king, but on a smaller scale with the several offices in charge of the members of certain families. Don't start that out to me. Oh, my God. <sighs> oh. Apologies. In the Ulster Journal on Archaeology, uh, Volume 3, page 117, will be found a valuable paper on Gaelic domestics, compiled chiefly from Anglo-Irish sources, in which this custom, as it existed in the 16th century, is very fully described. John Inman is saying hello from foggy Eureka in California. We used to be the, mo the, the most in that category. Uh, McKinleyville, actually, 10 miles north. Good evening, good afternoon to you, should I say, John. It's just after midday there. It's just after 8 p.m. Uh, here. From the description, and Marcus is telling us that he sees how... Uh, you know, Tolkien was inspired by the old tales. You can almost hear Tolkien within these writings now. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? Apologies for the yawning. Uh, that's I blame that on Rupert and Michael. Uh, myself and my good lady were uh, whining, and I was going to say dining, but not dining, just whining uh, with them uh, last night. And look, that's just entirely between you and if you promise to keep it a secret and don't tell anyone. Um. We were, yeah, uh, let's just say the, uh, the conversation went on until the early hours. Let's just put it that way. Paul McFeely is in the house. Good evening. Or in the library, even. And Paul, you're very welcome. Make yourself comfortable. All good on this side. Rohan was definitely the Celts and the Normans mixed. Oh, you can see that, can't you? Yeah. So I think somebody else should take over the reading and just let me go for a nap. Any volunteers? From the description given at page 43, it will be seen that there was a regular gradation of authority. The king of the Tua owed allegiance to the king of the Mor Tua, the king of the Mor Tua to the provincial king, and the provincial king to the Ard Re of all Ireland. But this was merely the theoretical arrangement. In the higher grades, it was very imperfectly carried out. The authority of the supreme monarch over the provincial kings was, in most cases, only nominal, like that of the early uh, Bret, Bretwaldas, Bretwaldas over the minor kings of the Heptarchy. He was seldom able to enforce obedience, so that they were often almost or altogether independent of him. That's very important to note. So the High King wasn't really the High King, you know. There never was a King of Ireland who really ruled the whole country. I always tell my visitors to tell her that. This is shocking. This is going on us. I'm going to be out like a lamp in about 20 minutes. You're going to have to finish this yourselves. Um, the King who came closest was Brian Baru. In like manner... The Uris, or under kings, were uh, often defied the authority of their superiors. The people grouped into families, clans, tribes, and kinels. 
he spells it K-I-N-E-L-S here as if it's an almost anglicized version of Kinnell, with only slight bonds of union. And with their leaders ever ready to quarrel, we're like shifting sand. This is a big problem with Ireland, ripe for the conquest because politically we were very fractured, although spiritually, it seems we were quite united. If the country had been left to work out its own destinies, this loose system would in the end have developed into one strong central monarchy, as in England and France. As matters stood, it was the weak point in the government. It left the country prey to internal strife, which the Supreme King was not strong enough to quell, and the absence of union rendered it impossible to meet foreign invasion by effectual resistance. Wow. That's a very important page. That is page 67 of this book, A Social History of Ancient Ireland, Volume 1, P.W. Joyce, published 1903. So this is uh, the final uh, section of this chapter, which is called The List of Over Kings. According to the ancient Bardic legends, five successive colonies arrived in Ireland many centuries before the Christian era. Of course, that is Laura Gawala, and we have discussed that on many episodes. The Partholonians, the Nemedians, the Fervolugs, the Dedanans, and the Milesians. The Bards say that government by monarchy began with the Fervolugs, whose first king and the first king of Ireland was Slánia. From the time of his ascension, uh, accession even, Ascension. Beam me up, Scotty. From the time of his accession down to the birth of Christ, they allow 107 monarchs, of whom nine were Fervolugs, nine Daedanans, and 89 Milesians. The last king of the period before the Christian era was Nuadu, Nuadu, Nuada Necht, or Nuadu the White. And his successor, Connery the First or Connery the Great, not to be confused with Sean Connery. We had this before. Connery, C O N A I R E. Uh, I think Connery is actually perhaps a slightly anglicised version of that name. Is it? I don't know. Caitlin Moon might be able to uh, shed some light on that. You know, Connery. You see, it's C O N A R I, but the actual spelling, I think, C O N A I R E. Connery. But anyway, Connery the Great was the first king belonging to the Christian era. The Milesian kings continued to reign till the time of Roderick O'Connor. The last over king of Ireland. I would not want to fall asleep on a live stream. I'd be afraid of what I might say in my sleep. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? No. The last over king of Ireland who died in 1198. Of course, that was uh, uh, just after the arrival of Strongbow and friends, a.k.a. the Normans, and who, according to the Bardic accounts, was the 193rd monarch of Ireland. A full list of the monarchs who reigned from the beginning of the Christian era is given below. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. We'll give the list from the Christian era onwards, but not the ones before that. A few of those, uh, Caitlin, remind me afterwards, I'll send you a picture of that page and send it on to you on a message if you want. A few of those before the Christian era, viz. those that figure most prominently in ancient Irish literature, are also given with their approximate dates. The dates down to the time of Lera, AD 428, he's the one who uh, was High King of Tara when St. Patrick, allegedly, <coughs> pardon me, when St. Patrick lit the Paschal fire at Slane, are given chiefly on the authority of O'Flaherty, who in his Ojigia has corrected the chronology of the Bards and the Shamachis. And that's a, a work that I'm not familiar with. Uh, the uh, Ojigia. Uh, so that's something I'll have to research and do work on. I've never heard it pronounced Connery in Saga. When I'm reading Old Irish out loud, my professor tells me to do my best Sean Connery impersonation. <laughs> uh, remember the books fell on his head, Sean Connery, and he said, I can only blame myself. As to the records of the very early kings, they cannot, of course, be received as history, but neither should they be rejected altogether. It is as much of a fault to be too sceptical as it is too credulous. NB, yes, indeed. On this subject of the Irish records of the early kings, Dr. Petrie, in his work on Tara, page 51, who was himself rather overcautious than overwise, makes the following judicious observations, quoting the distinguished Scottish Scotch historian Pinkerton, 
who was a determined, pardon me while I turn the page, who was a determined, oh, come on, a determined opponent of Ireland's early claims to distinction. Writing uh, of the reign of Tuchel the Legitimate, Tuchel Tecmar, King of Ireland in the second century, Dr. Petrie observes, and here follows a long quote. It is true indeed that the learned and judicious Sir James Ware has rejected, as of no certainty, the whole list of Irish kings anterior to the establishment of Christianity. But this overcautious rejection will have little weight now, even with the most judicious investigators. And in the opinion of Pinkerton, one of the most sceptical of modern antiquaries was at best rash. Mr. O'Connor remarks, says this writer, Pinkerton, that Tuchel's reign, AD 130 to 160, forms a new and certain epoch in the progress of Irish history. Foreigners may imagine that it is granting too much to the Irish to allow them lists of kings more ancient than those of any other country in modern Europe. But the singularly compact and remote situation of that island and its freedom from Roman conquest and from the concussions of the fall of the Roman Empire may infer this allowance not too much. But all contended for is the list of kings so easily preserved by the repetition of the bards at high solemnities and some grand events of history. For to expect a certain detail and regular order in the pagan history of Ireland were extravagant. Hmm. Monarchs before Monarchs of Ireland before the Christian era. So this is not necessarily the most readable, and I don't think I'll read the whole list, but I'll give you a sample of it, and uh, you may be able to get this book yourself. Good. We're all we're all up to date, I think. Heramon, the 19th monarch, was the first of the Milesian kings, and they placed that at uh, uh, 1015, 10, 1015 BC. 1015 BC. Uh, Tiernmas, the 26th king, was the first to smelt gold. Do you hear that, Tom King? Are you smelting gold out there in the forge just yet? He and his successor arranged the colours to be worn by the different classes. Wow. Tiernmas divided people into class. Mm. Or at least if they weren't, they were probably already divided into class, but he made them brand themselves accordingly. Olaf Fola, the 40th, founded the Triennial, triennial Fesh or Convention of Tara, uh, Fesh Charo. Eirua uh, de Thorba uh, Kimbaith reigned in turn immediately before Macha. Macha Mongrua, literally Macha of the red hair, or Macha of the golden hair, Rua. Ruddy, golden, okay. The 76th monarch, daughter of Eirua, the only female monarch. She founded the palace of Awan. Pardon me while I make some marginalia. Smelting burger, says Brendan Byrne, and the mound of the sausages, yes. Uh, Hugony the Great, uh, the 78th, Lowry Lungshek, the 81st, Rory, King of Ulster, who became King of Ireland at the 97th, uh, 105 BC, Yuki Felach, the 104th, 28 BC, Nuadu Necht, or Nuadu the White, the 107th monarch in 1 BC. And then we go, Kings of Ireland, Christian era. In the early part of this list, there is some uncertainty as to the exact dates. But after the time of Colohuas, uh, that is 327 to 331 AD, the dates may be taken as generally correct. In the latter part of the list, S means Southern High Neil, uh, and N, Northern High Neil, uh, or Enail, the O'Neill kings, for which and, sorry, for which and for kings with opposition, see Joyce, blah, 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 blah. <gasps> Connery I, the Great, began to reign about the first year of the Christian era. Louis Rhee of Jarrog, Louis of the Red Circles, 65 AD. Uh, and remember that Connery's uh, reign was about 64 years. Connor Amor. Conchobar uh, 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 Aurat Rua, Connor of the Red Brows, 73 AD. Cruvton Nianor, son of Louis Rhee of Jarrog, uh, 74. So a uh, Conquivar, uh, Connor of the Red Brows only ruled for a year. So something went wrong there, didn't it, folks? He probably got killed in a battle or either that or uh, things weren't too good and people killed him and so all of that stuff. Um, yeah, this is interesting. 
uh, to an extent. Carberry Kincat, uh, cat head, literally, Kincat, uh, 90 AD. Feradach Finn Fachnach, 95 AD. Feartach Finn, 117 AD. Feartha Finola, 117. Uh, Ellen McConra, 126. Tuhal the Legitimate, 130. Tuhal Tekmar. Uh, Mal Macria, uh, at 160, etc., etc. Let's have a look for Concade Kahak, the 100 fighter, is one of the uh, famous, really famous ones, 177 AD. Louis Macon, Louis, son of Con, uh, uh, actually, yes, so his brother, Art Ainfer, the solitary, uh, Ainfer, literally one man, uh, son of Con Cade Cahak, ruled in 220. And then in 250, Louis Macon, uh, who's presumably another son of Con, uh, ruled uh, from 250. So, wow. So his brother ruled for 30 years and then he took over. Uh, Fergus uh, Dovedach from the Black Teeth. Uh, Dove Dedach, should I say, of the Black Teeth, 253. Cormac Mac Art, son of Art the Solitary. Uh, Cormac Mac Art or Corm Cormac Ulfa, the 254 AD. Remember, he's the one who converted to Christianity and lived his last years at uh, Rossnery, choked on a salmon bone. And when his companions tried to take his body to Brunabonia, the Boyne River swelled up and wouldn't allow him to cross. Now, he converted to Christianity. Uh, in the 3rd century AD. But Christianity didn't come to Ireland until the 5th. Figure that one out. Uh, Yochi uh, Gunnath, 277. Carberry Liffacher, uh, literally Carberry of the Liffey, 279. Fiacha Sravtana, 279. Blah, 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 blah. Kailbid. Yochi Mugmadon, uh, or um, uh, as it is also rendered, Yochi uh, uh, Moivain, uh, 358. And of course, he was the father of Nile of the Nine Hostages. And the famous story there is that his wife, uh, Mungand, uh, they had four sons together. And then Yochi Mugmadon uh, took a concubine who was Karen, C-A-I-R-E-N-N. -N, and uh, she gave birth to Nile. And he, well, we, you know the rest. Crifton Moore, uh, anglicized Crifton Moore, uh, 366. Nile of the Nine Hostages, 379 A.D. Sorry, I forgot to highlight some of these. Um, apologies for sort of disturbing the flow here for a second. Uh, Concade Cahak. Tuhal Tekmar. Connery Moore. Connery Moore. Krivtha Nianor. Yeah, and then there's... Basically, that's the beginning of the reign of the O'Neills, Dahi, Lera, Larry, uh, 428. And of course, he was the one, Lera McNeil, uh, Lera, son of Nile, who was in charge when St. Patrick lit the Paschal fire. And the list continues and continues and continues. And I'm not going to read the rest of it. Who was... Uh, the last sort of, as it were, legitimate king of uh, high king of uh, Ireland, um, uh, Mile Shacklin the second, or Malachy the second, as it is uh, rendered anglicised, ten fourteen, and of course uh, he took over uh, from Brian Baru, uh, who was the king from ten o two until the Battle of Clontarf in ten fourteen. Mile Shacklin the first was nine eighty, and then there's kings with opposition. Uh, Donica or Donna, son of Brian Baru, uh, Jermud uh, Mac uh, Milnamo uh, of the race of Cahar, Cahar Moore, Turlock O'Brien of the Dalgas, Murkertak or Murta O'Brien, etc., uh, etc., et uh, and Donal O'Loughlin, Turlock O'Connor, and Murkertak O'Loughlin, and the very last, Roderick O'Connor, 1161. And of course, he took over uh, just as uh, that, uh, things were about to go pear shaped. With the arrival of the Normans, uh, eight, eight years after he began his reign, who were invited into Ireland at the behest of an Irish king, Dermot McMorrow. Josie Weatherford, hi, I'm late, but a wizard is never late, right? Correct, absolutely. Nor is she early. She arrives precisely when she means to.
Um, a three two two messenger asks: Was Saint uh, Dareka a real historical character or just a myth? And my immediate answer is: I do not know. I do not know. A lot of the stuff about Patrick is mythological. In fairness, um, yeah. So I am beginning the chapter. There seems to be a little bit of text missing here. Foreign conquests and colonizations. Yeah. Give me one second here now. One moment. Bear with me here. There's a little bit of text missing here uh, on this page, the way it was scanned and printed. This is a facsimile reprint. Um, just give me one moment until I see if I have a PDF version of this somewhere. What am I looking for? Um, uh, PW, what is it? PW Joyce, Social History of Ancient Ireland. Joyce, Joyce, of course. What have I got it filed under? Is it J for Joyce? No, it's not. It wouldn't be that simple, would it? Um, social history. No, it's not filed under Social History of Ancient Ireland either. Okay. Pardon me for this intermission and this distraction. Um, yeah, uh, my apologies. Uh, and no. Anybody else? Sandra Boothroyd is in the house. Just got home. Brilliant stuff, Sandra. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Now let me just see what page is this is. Number 72. Okay, let's see if we can scroll to 72 and see if there's a better version of it here. I'm just going to talk to myself here for a few moments. Which means I'm having a staff meeting. Isn't that right, Tom? Yeah, okay. I have it here. Uh, give, bear with me just another moment. I do apologize for this very rude interruption, folks. It's not good enough if you ask me, but anyway. Right. Okay, so I'll read it from the screen and then I'll continue with the second page on the book. Like their ancestors, the continental Celts, the Irish, from the earliest ages, had a genius for war and a love of fighting. The Roman geographer Salinus, writing in the 3rd century AD, says that Irish mothers were wont, wont to present the first food on the point of a sword to their newly born male infants. Wow. That's some way of weaning them, isn't it? As it were, to dedicate them to war. There is no mention of this custom in the native records so that we may safely set down the accounts as a fable like some other statements of this about ireland already noticed uh, at page 18 supra uh, which we probably encountered in the first episode but the story may be taken as indicating the warlike character the ancient irish had earned for themselves among foreign nations they were not contented with fighting at home but made themselves formidable in other lands their chief foreign conquests were in Wales and Scotland, but they unfrequently found their way to the continent. Uh, sorry, I just want to check up on the comments. Uh, Sue Prenter's in the house, had a phone call watching you with the sound down. Back online now. Brilliant stuff, Sue. Good evening and welcome. Martin Hodgins is uh, saying it's nice to be back in Drichard Aha after being away for a month. Welcome back, Martin. Good to see you. Uh, what page is it? Oh, sorry. I'm only seeing that now, uh, Josie. Yeah, uh, it was page 72. And actually, I think what I'll do is I'll print it off uh, and stick it into the book so that if I'm reading it again, I'll have it, you know. In those times, the Scots, as the Irish were then called, seems to have seemed to have been almost as much dreaded as the Norsemen were in later uh, ages. But did I tell you the Scotty, the Irish, giving the name of Scotland uh, 
given giving their name to Scotland. Scotland literally means the land of the Irish. Irish literature of every kind abounds in records of foreign invasions uh, and alliances. And it will be seen that the native accounts are corroborated by Roman writers uh, so far as they touch on these matters. In the Bardic legends, there is an account of an expedition, quote, beyond the sea, unquote, somewhere beyond the sea, <clears throat> probably to Britain, in the first century by Crifton Nianor, uh, King of Ireland, AD 74 to 90, and of his return with much treasure to the palace of Don Crifton or Ben Ether, and John McHugh used to tell us about this. Uh, Joan was on last week or the week before. She hadn't been on in a while, and hopefully we'll see her again soon. But she lives down in Ben Ether, and she was telling us about uh, Dun Cruffin. At a still earlier time, the old Shanachis celebrate the foreign expeditions of two other kings, Angus Olmokad and Hugony the Great. Almost sounds like Hugeno, uh, H-U-G-O-N-Y. All who have read the histories of England and Rome know how prominently the Picts and Scots figure during the first four centuries of our era and how much trouble they gave to both Romans and Britons. The Picts were the people of Scotland, the Scots were the Irish Gaels. Quote, the Scots who afterwards, sorry, marginalia, the Scots who afterwards settled in what is now known as Scotland at that time dwelt in Ireland. The invasions of the Picts and Scots are celebrated by many ancient writers, among them by Gildas in, in his history. As a protection against those these two tribes, the Romans at different intervals in the second and third centuries built those great walls or ramparts from sea to sea between Britain and Alban, so well known in the history of those times, of which there are still considerable remains. For three or four centuries, the Irish continued their incursions to Britain and Scotland, sometimes fighting as invaders against the Picts, sometimes combining with them against Romans and Britons. And as a consequence, there were several settlements of colonies from Ireland in Wales and Scotland. Wow, fascinating stuff. Bloody Romans. <laughs> an ancient Irish historical tale entitled The Banishment of the Daishi gives an account of one of these migrations. It is a well-known historical fact noticed in the Irish annals of these times that a numerous and powerful tribe called the Daishi, who dwelt near Tara, were expelled for a breach of law from their district, which retains the name Dees to this day, D-E-E-C-E, -E -E, probably an anglicization of that, uh, by Cormac MacArt in the third century. See Daisha in the index, D-E-I-S-E. -E. Part of these went to Munster and settled in a territory which now retains their name the two baronies of the Daisies in, in the county Waterford. And that helps me to understand something, the Daisy who are kind of um, associated with Munster, actually originally from a region near Tara. Another part crossing over to Wales under their leader named Yochi. What a name, what? Uh, what an unusual name for an Irish king or leader. Yochi, yes, we've seen it time and time before, going all the way back to the Dagda. Uh, the king of the two of the Danon, Yochi Olahar. They settled down in a district called Dyfed, D-Y-F-E-D. -E I'm absolutely guaranteed to be pronouncing that incorrectly. And apologies, my apologies to our Welsh viewers. And preserved their individuality as an immigrant tribe for many generations. This migration and settlement is related in detail in one of the Irish historical stories, a relation that receives so much collateral and incidental confirmation from Welsh records, totally independent of the Irish authorities, that we cannot doubt its substantial authority, accuracy even. The account of the conquests of the Irish in West Britain, given in Cormac's glossary, written in the 9th or 10th century from older authorities, may be regarded as generally reliable for it is corroborated by other records and indications from political 
uh, sorry, from political, from independent sources. In this glossary, we are told a story about a lapdog which was brought from the east from Britain by Carberry Musk, a well-known historical Irish personage from whom certain districts in Ireland still called Muscria or Muscari took their name. He was the son of Conora II, or Connery II, if you prefer, a king of Ireland, from AD 212 to 220, and was brother of that Rioda mentioned by Bede as the leader of a colony from Ireland to Scotland. Cormac's glossary, page 111, says, For when great was the power of the Gael in Britain, they divided Alban between them into districts, and each knew the residence of his friend, and not less did the Gael dwell on the east side of the sea than in Scotia, Ireland, and their habitations and royal forts were built there. Whence is named Din Tradwy, i.e. the triple-fast fort of Criffin the Great, son of Fidach, son of our, uh, King of Ireland, and of Alban to the Ictian Sea, the English Channel, and hence also is uh, Glamispear or Glastonbury of the Gael, i.e. a church on the border of the Ictian Sea. Thus, every Irish tribe divided the land on that side. For its, i.e. the tribe's, property on that side was equal to that on the west. And they continued in this power to long after the coming of Patrick. So, uh, yes, Michael Trott is saying uh, hi there to uh, Jiglic. In the Irish Independent today, Frank Coughlin mentions sorry i'm just going to uh, yeah, mark my place here uh what was he saying um the irish independent frank cochran mentions the later 12th century geraldus Cambrensis wrote two hugely influential journals which normal Con norman conquest by depicting the native gale scotty or irish a savage or degenerate yeah yeah we had some i think we had a couple at least of episodes about geraldus Cambrensis. Uh, and his topographic topographica. Um, so uh, if you missed those, uh, Michael, good to go back uh, and read over them. He was a propagandist, of course, um, and yeah, uh, painted the Irish in a less than favourable light. Hence, Carborough Musk was visiting his family and friends in the East when the episode of the lapdog occurred. This Criffin the Great, King of Ireland and of Alban to the Ictian Sea, who is to be distinguished from the Criffin mentioned at page 73, reigned in Ireland from AD 366 to 379. He is celebrated for his conquests in Britain, not only in Cormac's glossary as quoted above, but in all the Irish histories and traditions dealing with that time. So uh, some people are a bit sore about the British conquest of Ireland. Uh, I, I wonder some of those people, do they realise historically that actually uh, before, long before uh, the British tried to colonise Ireland, uh, the reverse was happening, you know. His reign is almost exactly coincident with the command of the Roman gener general Theodosius, father of the Emperor Theodosius the Great, who, according to the Roman historians, uh, checked the career of the Gaels and their allies. The Irish accounts of Criffin's invasion of Britain are, in the main, corroborated by the Roman poet Claudian in those passages of his poem that celebrate the victories of Theodosius. While Criffin and his allies, the Picts, were vigorously pushing their conquests in Britain, the Saxons, who were at this time beginning their inroads, made themselves equally formidable. The continental, sorry, the continual attacks of the three tribes became at last so intolerable that the Roman government was forced to take defensive measures. In 367, the year after Criffin's accession, Theodosius was appointed to the military command of Britain, and after two active campaigns, he succeeded in delivering Britain for the time from the invaders. The following short passage, translated from Claudian's poem, pictures vividly the triumph achieved by Theodosius over the three hostile tribes. Quote, uh, the orcades flowed with Saxon gore. Thul became warm with the blood of the Picts. The icy Eirn, i.e. Ireland, wept for her heaps of slaughtered Scots. In another passage uh, of the same poem, Claudian boasts that Theodosius chased the Irish from the British shores and 
pursued them out to sea. Though all this, no doubt, is in the main true history, we must make some allowance for the poet's natural tendency to exaggeration in his laudatory account of the great Roman general's exploits. History is written by the victor and sometimes embellished a little bit uh, in, in the effort. Me. Very tired tonight. Criffin was succeeded as King of Ireland by Nile of the Nine Hostages, AD 379 to 405, who was still more distinguished for foreign conquests than his predecessor. More in his history thus speaks of his incursions into Wales. Quote, an invasion of Britain on a far more extensive and formidable scale than had yet been attempted from Ireland took place towards the close of the four, the close of the fourth century under Nile of the nine hostages, one of the most gallant of all the princes of the Milesian race. Observing that the Romans had retired to the eastern shore of Britain, Nile collected a great fleet and, landing in Wales, carried off immense plunder. He was forced to retreat by the valiant Roman general Stilicho, Stilicho but quote, left marks of depredation and ruin wherever he passed, unquote. On this occasion, Claudian, when praising Stilicho, Stilicho, says of him, speaking in the person of Britannia, by him was I protected when the Scot, i.e. Nile, moved all Ireland against me and the ocean foamed with their hostile oars. Niles' invasion is mentioned by several Irish authorities as, for instance, an ancient Latin life of St. Patrick, from which the following extract is quoted by Usher in his Primordia, page 587. Quote, <coughs> pardon me, I need to take a drink for a moment. And it is water, just in case anyone's wondering what is in the Star Wars bottle. <sighs> I am your water bottle. Um... Let me see. Peter Woods. Uh, yeah, I am tired because uh, uh, the prehistory guys kept me up last night. I swear it wasn't my fault. Yeah. Kathy May Dale was in the house on her lunch break and in on the second half. Good afternoon to you, Kathy May. Hello, and I hope you're well. Oh, excuse me. And uh, 3 t 2 Messenger is saying that uh, uh, Dararka, who's, I think he's suggesting, was it the sister of St. Patrick? Died on the 22nd of March. And Paddy's Day, of course, is the 17th of March. Maybe some connection there with the vernal equinox, I think you were suggesting there. Yeah. Coda says hello again. The Scotty of Hibernia. Under their king, Nile of the Nine Hostages, devastated several of the Roman provinces of Britain during the reign of Constant... Constantius, the son of Constantine. They began their incursions on the north of Britain, from which, after a time, by their armies and fleets, they expelled the inhabitants and took possession of the country. Coda's taken over. He's doing the reading. <laughs> this old writer, however, is in error as to the time of Nile's invasion. Constantius had indeed, as we know from other sources, to proceed against the Picts and Scots. Con Constantius had indeed, as we know from other sources, to proceed against the Picts and Scots. But he died in 361. That's sentence doesn't make sense but anyway and Niall's expedition did not take place in his reign but in that of Theodosius the Great. The extensive scale of those terrible raids is strikingly indicated by no less an authority than St. Patrick who in his confession speaking of the expedition probably led by Niall in which he himself was captured says quote I was then about 16 years of age being ignorant of the true God 
and was brought captive into Ireland with so many thousand men, according as we had deserved. Wow. And that's from the tripartite life of Patrick. <laughs> yep. Linda Cosma says, greetings all. Hello, Linda. You're very, very welcome. Dune. I haven't read the Dune books. Dune. Dune? Dune? I haven't read them, uh, Marcus. No. Um, Kathy May says, the prehistory guys are so funny. They are. Uh, and very nice, too. And very learned. The Irish narratives of Niall's life and actions add that he invaded Gaul, which was his last exploit, for he was assassinated on the shore of the ri ri just pronounce it on it, River Loire. I was going to say Liver Loire. <laughs> on the shore of the River Loire by one of his own chiefs, the King of Leinster, who shot him dead with an arrow. Wow. The Irish legendary account of the origin of Niles Cognomen runs parallel with the history of his foreign conquests. O'Cleary gives it in his glossary from some old authority, quote, because he took hostages from the five provinces of Ireland and also French, Saxon, British and Alban hostages. So he took hostages from basically nine districts or regions. Welsh scholars from Lloyd to two, of two centuries ago to principal Rees of the present day, as well as historical inquirers of other nationalities, have investigated this question of the Irish conquests in Wales, quite independently of Irish records. And they have come to the conclusion that, at some early time, extensive districts of Wales were occupied by the Irish. That is to say, Gales are, are, uh, or, ga or Gales, Goyles or Gales direct from Ireland, as distinct from an earlier and far more extensive occupation by Gales from continental Gaul. As a consequence of the later occupation by Irish Gales, numerous places in Wales have to this day names commemorating the invaders. As for instance, the Welsh name of Hollyhead, which I will absolutely butcher, so please forgive me, Cerrig y Gwydl, the rocks of the Gales or Gales, G-O-I-D-E-L-S or G-A-E-L-S. But the Welsh language contains I many Irish words or words evidently derived from Irish. There are still in Anglesey, says Dr. Jones, in his book on this subject, Vestiges of the Gale in Gwynedd, oval, quote, oval and circular trenches, which we see in great plenty, called, it looks like city, C-Y-T-T-I-E, Er Gwydelod. Uh, the Irish men's cottages. These, of course, are what we know in Ireland as lisses or rats, which the Irish built up in their newly adopted country according to the fashion of their own. Ring forts, basically, folks. Ring forts. Irish ring forts in Wales. Fascinating. After a careful... Examination of all the evidence, Dr. Jones comes to the conclusion that the Gales from Ireland once occupied the whole of Anglesey, Carnarfon, uh, uh, Merioneth, and Cardiganshire, and parts of Denbyshire, Montgomery, and Radnor. Still another trace of the footsteps of the Irish Gale in Britain is the existence of a number of Oams in Wales. For, so far as we know, Oam was peculiar to the Irish. But besides all this, ancient Welsh literature, history, annals, tales, legends, like that of Ireland, abounds in references to invasions of Wales and other parts of Britain by Irishmen. I'm fascinated by all this. Really fascinating. The continual intimate relationship by intermarriage between the Irish kings and chiefs on the one side and the ruling families of Western and Northern Britain on the other are fully set forth in a series of valuable genealogical articles by the Reverend John Francis Shearman in the Kilkenny Archaeological Journal for 1879 to 1884, which are reprinted in his Loca Patriciana. We have seen the record in Cormac's glossary, page 75, Supra, that the Irish retained 
their sway in Britain long after the arrival of St. Patrick in 432. Of this, there is a curious incidental corroboration in a passage in the story of Borova. When Brandulf, the powerful king of Leinster, in the end of the 6th century, heard that Prince Komuska was coming to Leinster on a youthful free circuit about AD 597, he did not wish to receive, quote, uh, this is part of a quote, uh, no, it's not part of a quote, apologies. He did not wish to receive him personally, knowing his licentious character. Quote, let a messenger, said he, uh, unquote, said he, quote again, be sent to them, prince and retinue, and let them be told that I have gone to into Britain uh, to levy rent and tribute, unquote. After the period, sorry, lots of mistakes tonight because I'm tired. About the period of the series of expeditions to Wales, the Irish also mastered the Isle of Man. And Irish literature abounds with references to the constant intercourse kept up by the parent people with those of their little insular colony. Uh, though the Norsemen wrested the sovereignty of the island from them in the 9th century, they did not succeed in displacing either the Gaelic people or their language. The best possible proof of the Irish colonization and complete and continued occupation of the island is the fact that the Manx language is merely a dialect of Irish, spelled phonetically but otherwise very little altered. There are still also to be seen all over the island Irish buildings and monuments mixed up, however, with many of Norse origin, and the great majority of both the place names and the native family names are Gaelic. Absolutely fascinating stuff. It is curious that the idea of having a sort of claim to the Isle of Man still lingered among the Irish at the end of the 11th century, when the Danes held it. For the analyst Tiernock records an expedition to the island from Leinster in 1060, which occurred during his own lifetime, a record given also by the four masters, as well as by other analysts. Chernock's words are, AD 1060, quote, Morcha, king of them, uh, Morcha uh, would be a sea warrior, which is a, an early version of the name Murphy. Uh, Morcha, king of Leinster, son of King Jermot Mac Mailnamo, uh, invaded man and took tribute out of it and defeated Rhinel's son. The Danish ruler. Niall's successor, Dahi. Uh, us Murphys have been causing trouble for millennia, apparently. Niall's successor, uh, Dahi, uh, King of Ireland, AD 405 to 428, followed in the footsteps of his predecessors and, according to Irish authorities, invaded Gaul, but was killed by a flash of lightning at the foot of the Alps after his followers had destroyed the hermitage of a recluse named Forminius or Parmenius. Although this legend looks wild and improbable, it is in some respects corroborated by continental authorities and by present existing names of places at the head of Lake Zurich, so that there is likely some foundation for the story. Yeah, he was killed by lightning near Lake Zurich. Wow. Judith says, us Murphy's lol, I'm a Murphy. And Murphy's law, don't forget, anything that can go right will go right. That's it, really, it is. The record of the death of Lyra, Dahi's successor, and King of Ireland when St. Patrick arrived, which is mainly historical, though somewhat mixed with legend, tends to confirm the preceding accounts of the foreign expeditions of the Irish kings. It had been prophesied for by sorry, it had been prophesied for this king by some old druid that he was destined to be killed between Aaron and Alban, and accordingly, in order to circumvent the prophecy, he remained at home. <laughs> Clever, huh? And never attempted to imitate the foreign expeditions of his predecessors. Very wise. But on one occasion he invaded Leinster in violation of a solemn oath. Uh, sworn by the elements, whereupon, says the legend, he was killed by the sun and wind at the side of a little river named Cass at a marshy spot situated between two hills named Aaron and Alban. 
I kid you not, uh, so that the prophecy was fulfilled. That sounds like an Irish story if ever I've heard one. We will now go back in point of time to sketch the Irish colonization of North Britain, the accounts of which, however, are, are a good deal mixed with those of Welsh settlements. We have about two more pages to read and then we'll call it a night for this week. From the very early ages, the Irish of Ulster were in the habit of crossing the narrow sea to Alban or Scotland, where colonies were settled from time to time, and constant intercourse was kept up between the two countries down to a late period. The authentic history of these expeditions and settlements begins in the early part of the 3rd century, during the reign of Conor II, AD 212 to 220. This king had three sons, Carberry Musk, who has already been mentioned in connection with Wales, Carberry Baskin and Carberry Rieda. At this time, a great famine devastated Munster and Carberry Rieda led a number of his people to the north of Ireland and to the southwest of Scotland, in both which places they settled down permanently. A brief statement of this migration and of its cause is given in Lowerbreck. Part of the Irish text may be seen in Stokes's Lives of S.S. The following is a translation of that portion of the passage immediately bearing on our subject. Quote, Dalreatha and the Fir Alban, the men of Scotland, they are both of the seed of Corpora Rigfutha, i.e. Carberry Rieda, son of Conora, son of Mog of Munster. <coughs> Great famine came on Munster. <coughs> so that the seed of Corpora Rigfutha departed from it and one division of them reached Scotland while the other division remained in Erin in the present county Antrim. Whence the Dalreatha of both, of both Scotland and Ireland to this day. They afterwards increased and multiplied in these two districts till the time of Aidan uh, MacGowrain, King of Alban, Scotland, and of Aid Mac Einmirach, pardon me, King of Ireland. The Lower Breck then goes on to give an account of the dispute between these two kings which was subsequently settled at Drumketa. Adavnan uh, more than once mentions both, both Aedon and Aed Mac Einmirach, as well as the convention at Drumketa, and so far corroborates the accounts of the native Irish authorities. Uh, Adavnan wrote the life of St. Colum Kill, didn't he? St. Columba. These Irish narratives are confirmed by the Venerable Bede in his Ecclesiastical History, where he says, quote, In course of time, besides the Britons and Picts, Britain received a third nation, the Scots, who, migrating from Ireland under their leader Riova, obtained for themselves, either by a friendly agreement or by force of arms, those settlements among the Picts which, which they still hold. From the name of the commander, they are to this day called Dalredini. In their tongue, Dal signifies a part. The Dalredini, which is obviously based on Dalreada, or Dalreata, if you prefer, of Bede, is the Dalreada of Irish history. Stop interjecting, Anthony, and just read the damn thing. He correctly interprets Dal, for Dalreada signifies Riada or Riada's portion. And the word Dal or Doyle is in use at the present day. And of course, Doyle Aaron is the Parliament of Ireland. These primitive settlers increased and multiplied, as Lower Brack says, and supported from time to time by contingents from the mother country, they held their ground against the Picts. But the settlement was weak and struggling till the reign of Louis, King of Ireland, AD 483 to 512, about three centuries after the time of Carberry Rieda. In the year 503, three brothers named Fergus, Angus and Lorna, sons of a chief named Irk, a direct descendant of Carberry Rieda, led a colony to Scotland from their own district in the Irish Dal Rieda, descendants of the Munster settlers of three centuries before. They appear to have met with little or no opposition and being joined by the previous settlers, they took possession of a large territory of which Fergus, commonly called Fergus Mac Irk, and also known as Fergus Moore, Fergus the Great, uh, was the first king. The descendants of these colonists ultimately mastered the whole country, and from them its name was changed from Alban to Scotia or Scotland. Fergus was the ancestor of the subsequent kings of Scotland, and from him, in one of their lines of genealogy, 
descend through the Stuarts, our present royal family. The memory of these three princes is deeply graven on the history of Scotland, and many Scottish persons and places have been named from them, of which examples will occur to anyone moderately acquainted with the history and topography of Scotland. So I'm just going to go back a little bit here for a second. We're finished now, but am I right? So the the, the Dalriatha were based near Tara, am I right? And then they were tossed out and some of them went south into Munster and some of them went north and eventually over into Scotland. And am I right in saying that, yeah. In the year 503, three brothers named Fergus, Angus and Lorne, sons of a chief named Urk, a direct descendant of Carberry Riada, led a colony to Scotland from their own district in the Irish Dal Riada, descendants of the Munster settlers of three centuries before. Wow, I'm going to have to read that again, not necessarily right now on the live stream, but there is so much in this book. There really is just so much. I mean, every page has gold in it. You know, it's fabulous. It's really, really fascinating. Um, and so if you wanted a companion volume to this to help you, uh, well, a companion volumes um one would be irish kings and high kings by francis uh, fj Byrne, and the other is what's his name uh, early irish early christianity in ireland early christian ireland I just can't remember the author's name uh, charles edwards yeah um but i mean there's enough in here uh, it's really uh, mind-blowing you know he yeah, had the holy roman empire says sotoner where Carrick Fergus gets its name today in Ireland. What's that? Carrick Fergus, as in Fergus. Sorry, did we mention what's his name? Yes, Fergus, the ancestor of the subsequent kings of Scotland. Wow. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Carrick. Carrick being a rock, isn't it? Carrick, the rock of Fergus, basically. Yeah. Kim McCone says, Caitlin, yeah. Uh, what's Kim McCone's book called, Caitlin? Remind me, will you? Pagan Past and Christian Present by Kim McCone. Thank you. Yeah, there you go, folks, if you're looking for other reading material. But, I mean, look, this is widely available as a, a facsimile reprint. Um, I, I, I think I got it during the pandemic for about 15 euros. Um, and that's volume one. I mean, I haven't got volume two, but I will look out for it. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Fascinating stuff. Anne McCallum, seriously interesting stuff. Yes, absolutely. So long, long before, I mean, it is maybe a prop, an un unpopular thing to say, but long before the British conquest of Ireland and the Norman conquest of Ireland, we had the Dalriatha who uh, were conquering parts of Scotland. We had uh, 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 Niall heading off into Wales um, and we had uh, even conquests of Gaul or attempted conquests of Gaul. Uh, fascinating stuff, you know. Uh, and Fergus, of course, uh, being the Irish ancestor of the Scottish kings. Mm. I didn't realize that connection to the Stuarts, but anyway, that's something I'll have to go back into because it's just too much. It's too much to absorb right now. And of course, I need to, as Elaine says, get some sleep. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, all very interesting. I'm really loving this. I'm, I'm just thinking that, you know, I've made so many margin notes and, yeah, you know, uh, scribbles uh, that... It's quite obvious to me that this is just one of these brilliant works that um, is is mind opening. Now, of course, bear in mind that the reason I'm recommending the likes of Francis Byrne and uh, Caitlin uh, Kim McCone and Charles Edwards is that's contemporary work. Um, you know, uh, Joyce was writing in 1903 or published in 1903. Um, uh, so some of this. Uh, you know the way every generation of scholars comes up with sort of new information and new insights into something and uh you know a slight revision of his of the accepted historical facts of the past yes anthony it is the past because it's history yes indeed you're very welcome adrian yes i thought that was absolutely fascinating and that, of course uh, that is uh, just uh, section one of that chapter so the chapter is called warfare uh, and the first section that we've read tonight was called foreign conquests and colonizations next week we will have military ranks orders and services just having a look here to see 
well, how long that section is. Oh, yeah, that looks like an episode's worth. Yeah, that section is quite lengthy, actually. Yeah. So that's uh, next week's will be military ranks, orders, and services. Really interesting. Yeah. Anyway, uh, medieval Ireland is complex. If you want to study uh, medieval Ireland, uh, be prepared for the long haul. It's complex and there's tons of sources, not least, say, the annals and uh, Cormac's glossary and the lives of the saints and all of that. Uh, there's a ton of, of research and depth uh, diving to be done. Uh, to get a real handle on it. A very good place to start if you're interested in medieval Ireland is Matthew Stout's book, uh, Early Medieval Ireland, which chronicles the history of Ireland from the arrival of, I think it's from the arrival of St. Patrick until the arrival of the Normans. Uh, um, can't immediately see it now. Oh, there it is. Yeah, 431 to 1169, yeah, so uh, the year before the arrival of St. Patrick until um, just before the arrival of the uh, uh, the lads, uh, the Normans. Great reading, Anthony. I absolutely love this book, and I'm so glad to hear it read on your show. There's a fascinating part about the origin of the Picts. He goes into it later. Matriarchal marriage. Brilliant stuff, Josie. Look forward to that. And yeah, this is, uh, we are, what, 243? We're, we're, we're almost at 250 episodes and still finding you know, really riveting material, you know, it's not getting boring at all, you know, uh, thanks, uh, Marcus, I hope you're, uh, I hope you have a great week, and indeed, to all of you, um, I hope you have a fabulous week, and uh, hope to see some of you at the uh, Boyne Valley Trails September Walking Festival events this week, uh, in particular, of course, uh, the Mythical Ireland-led ones, which are the uh, myths and legends of Tara on Saturday at two o'clock, and the myths and legends of Bruna Bonia starting at one o'clock on Sunday. And don't forget the uh, link there, which is uh, the uh, uh, Boyne Valley Trails.ie website. I'll just paste it in there again. Yeah. So have a fabulous week, everybody. Hope to see you all for the next one. In the meantime, uh, do keep an eye out on the social media. If you're on Facebook, uh, don't forget the Facebook page, which is, which is facebook.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. Or if you're on the app, just look for Mythical Ireland. And of course, the Facebook, uh, the uh, Mythical Ireland community on Facebook. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And please, as always, do uh, consider uh, supporting Mythical Ireland by becoming a patron. Uh, Tom King says, a lovely episode. So many kings. I'm in great company. <laughs> Tom King. Uh, thank you, Anthony and the Mighty Tua. Take care out there. Until next time, Coco Buggy. And, of course, to yourself, Gialat, August Tufain. Uh, Sloan Gafold says, uh, Josie Caitlin Moon says, this was brilliant. It's fascinating stuff, isn't it? Really brilliant. Uh, thank you, Orburgest22. Uh, I think you told me what your name was earlier, and I forget. And, and for which I apologize. Um, yeah, we'll see you all next week. For now, all that remains for me to say is Ikawa Kolosov, Slong of Fole. Bye for now, and of course, take it easy. Togabogay. <laughs>